Hey, welcome to the One Piece of the Time Distilling Institute with your host, the alchemist of Indiana's Black Forest, Alan Bishop. Hey, this channel is all about home distilling and legal distilling. If you've got questions, reach out to us in the comments below, social media, or via bishopshomegrown at gmail.com. And don't forget to check out thealchemistcabinet.com. All right, guys, we're going to get a little sciency on this one. So we recently did a video about how to design a mash bill, right? Where I told you how to figure out um, the poundage based on the percentage of grain that you're using, <clears throat> based on the amount of alcohol that that grain is actually going to contribute overall to the finished product. And that formulation was to be found in the Alchemist Cabinet Volume 1 philosophy that I wrote several years ago that we just republished. It is on uh, thealchemistcabinet.com. Sorry. Uh, underneath the warehouse and you can order it from there and I'll sign it for you if you want me to sign it. I don't have to sign it if you don't want me to, but a lot of people have asked me to do it. So I offer it as, you know, a freebie and for, for fun. But one of the other things that is in this book is, um, how to figure out whether or not your mash bill is efficient. And what do I mean by that? Well, anybody can design any mash bill. You can say, I want to use whatever percent of whatever to make a whiskey, right? So a good example would be corn. I'm going to make hundred percent corn whiskey. Not unless you have exogenous enzymes or you malt the 100% corn, are you going to make corn whiskey? Because otherwise it will not work for you. Um, the way that old school distillers designed their mash bills was they had to figure out the efficiency of that mash bill. And what I mean by that is they have to figure out if that mash bill was actually fermentable. If you were going to actually be able to create enough sugar from it using the natural enzymes in your malt to be able to actually get enough product off of it to make that mash bill worthwhile. In other words, things like 95.5, 95% rye, 5% malt, those were not things that were being done in the old days unless you were using rye malt or a very high percentage of rye malt, which 95.5 precludes because there would not be enough what is called diastatic power to convert the unmalted grains into sugars from starch. It wouldn't be possible. Exogenous enzymes make that possible because you're able to add them in outside of the grain source. Traditional whiskey was also always made using those malted grains to give that diastatic power to the mash bill to be able to convert the unmalted grains from starch into sugar. Not all malts are made the same way. Some malts are very high diastatic power. They have a greater efficiency to break down starch into sugar via the amount of enzymes that is in them than certain other malts might have. Even with corn, for example, corn is only just high enough to just barely convert what is left of the starch in the actual corn malt itself. It will not convert any other grains outside of the malted corn. So even if you put 50% malted corn into a mash bill without any exogenous enzymes, uh, it's not going to have enough diastatic power to convert the rest of the grains in that particular mash bill. And so it's not going to be a very efficient uh, fermentation. It's not going to really be economically viable or worthwhile. That's why this information is important to have. And while, yes, we do have exogenous enzymes now that we do rely on and can rely on, or a lot of people do rely on, if you want to make true old-fashioned whiskey, you have to do it without the exogenous enzymes. You have to do it using the enzymes available within the malts that you have available to you. And to be able to know how to do that, you should know that formulation. You should be able to figure out exactly what your efficiency is and how much time and effort you need to put into something. That's exactly why I originally wrote uh, volume one of the book was because I had all these formulas uh, that I had to, as a distiller, memorize, rolling around in my head all the time, and I'd repeat them over and over and over and over and over again until I finally memorized them uh, multiple times. But, you know, as it is with your brain, it's like a computer, right? I don't have an extra hard drive, so I had to write all this stuff down because eventually new information is going to push some of this information to the side, and so the book became my hard drive, so I would always have all of that memorized. Um, so the one thing that you need to know is that <clears throat> to be considered uh, self-converting, a mash bill and or a malt would have to have a 30 DP, 30 diastatic power. It's based on a point system, right? And most of the time, a good uh, maltster or malt house will be able to give you the exact diastatic power of the malt that they are selling you so that you can figure out exactly how efficient that you are once again. Now, to give you some ideas here, uh, your highest diastatic power are going to fall to 
uh, things like uh, six row barley malt. That's going to be what you'd consider distiller's malt. That's going to be your highest diastatic power out there. Next underneath that's going to be things like rye malt and wheat malt. Uh, two row barleys are going to have far less efficiency, although some are fairly decent. Uh, anything toasted or roasted is going to be pretty much null. I mean, it may have a tiny little bit, but may, mostly enough to convert itself, uh, if even that. Uh, corn malt is going to be extremely low and barely even able to convert itself. So, uh, looking at the book here, we're going to, we're going to read through this and I think you guys will be able to follow it. And this might be a reason for you guys to buy the book. And if not, you can use the information I'm giving you here absolutely free because my goal, the one piece of distilling time Institute is to help you as a distiller become a better distiller. So I don't mind to share the things that I've written in the book, even though the book is for sale. So to figure out the diastatic power of your mash, you simply take the sum total of all of your pounds of malted grain. That's all the pounds of malted grain that you have in your mash bill. We talked about that mash bill before. And what I mean by that is if you have a mash bill that is 70% corn, 20% uh, wheat, 10% malt, your total pounds of malt is uh, 10, whatever that 10% is, whatever that poundage is for that mash bill. You then multiply that poundage by the sum total of all the diastatic power of your malted grain. So in other words, if you had more than one malted grain in there, you'd add their two diastatic powers together, right? And multiply that poundage by that. Then you divide the given number by the total pounds of grain. That's all the grains add together. Your 70% corn, your 20% wheat, your 10% malt, whatever the poundages are, add them all together and divide by the number by the total pounds of grain in your mash bill. I know that sounds confusing, but if you go back and you listen to what I just said to you, even if you have to listen to it multiple times, you'll be able to figure this out. I'm going to read it one more time just so you can hear me. To figure out the diastatic power of your mash bill, simply take the sum total of all of your pounds of malted grain and multiply it by the sum total of all the diastatic power of your malted grain and then divide the given number by the total pounds of grain in your mash bill. The reason that this is important is because if that mash bill comes in under 30, it's going to be less than 100% efficient, right? Because 30 is self-converting. 30 will convert all the starches in your mash bill into fermentable sugars, or mostly fermentable sugars. Whatever amount less than 30 you end up with, that's how you figure out your efficiency, because what percentage of 30 is that number? So. If you end up on 27, what percentage of 30 is 27? A few common malt linter slash diastatic numbers. Malted corn, 27 to 30. Maris Otter malt, 120. Rye malt, 190. Six row distiller's malt, 250. So let's say you decide on a distiller's malt and you're using your 70% corn, 20% wheat, 10% malt recipe from above. You only have one malted grain, and you decide to use distiller's malt, which you have 10.6 pounds of according to your mash bill. Distiller's malt has a linter value of 250. So 10.6 times 250 equals 2,650 divided by the total weight of all the grain in your mash bill, including malt. Meaning that your total diastatic power would be 27.7, just nearly enough to convert all the starch. Because again, 30 is self-converting. If you divide the diastatic power of 27.7 by the power needed to convert all the starch, which is 30, you'll see the percentage converted, 92.3% efficiency. 92.3% efficiency was considered fairly high back in the day, although if you go back to pre-prohibition mash bills, you will often see higher than 10% malt in a mash bill. You'll often see 15 and 20% because they're trying to be as efficient as what they possibly can. However, I will say from a quality standpoint, that is one of the differences between pre-prohibition uh, whiskeys and post-prohibition whiskeys. Pre-prohibition, you were not being 100% efficient most of the time. And because of that, you had more starch left behind in the matrix that you were distilling and the raw material that you were distilling. Now, while that starch doesn't distill over, it does have aromatic precursors that do come across and connect themselves to the alcohol. And thus, you get more of an aroma and an illusion of the grain that you started with in that mash bill. Subsequently, that grain becomes uh, a more prominent part of the flavor of that finished whiskey. Again, I know that all sounds confusing, but I think if you go back and you listen to what I said in here, 
you'll get a pretty good understanding of what I'm driving at, especially if you go back and you figure out, you can look at the video we did before and you figure out how to make a proper mash bill. Come up with a mash bill, write down your percentages, figure out that mash bill math that we did previously, figure out your poundages, and then go through and do the diastatic power math and see if that malt, if that mash bill is worth making without diastatic or without exogenous enzymes, right? Figure out what its percentage efficiency is. Uh, I even put in here some inefficiency in a pot still is warranted and wanted as those unconverted starches will provide flavor to the matrix of water and ethanol to be distilled. If you want a full conversion, it will require either an increase in the percentage of malt or the use of artificial enzymes. If you use artificial enzymes, it's important to use those with no side activity as once these enzymes break down starch, they then begin breaking down cellulose, which produces wood alcohol, also known as methanol, a waste product covered earlier in this book, which is poisonous and also leads to off flavors in the whiskey. So, again, I think you guys can follow that. You guys are all fairly advanced distillers, or at least that's who we're, we're trying to really market this channel to as much as anything. Um, if nothing else, it might give you an excuse to pick up the book, The One Piece of the Time Distilling Institute, The Alchemist Cabinet Philosophy, Volume 1, where you will get all those math uh, formulas in here and just give you an idea of what else is in here uh, on the formula side of things. So, of course, there are definitions, etc. There's uh, uh, to determine the amount of proofing water uh, to add to a distillate. Uh, there's, of course, specific gravity and how to change specific gravity to bricks, etc. Uh, there's the mash bill design stuff. There's a section on enzymes and malt. Uh, there is, of course, uh, what we just talked about with the figuring out the efficiency. There is a section regarding bricks and chapitalization. Chapitalization is the adding of sugar uh, to a particular uh, base in order to raise the percentage of alcohol that you can produce and how you figure out exactly how much sugar you need to add to a certain volume in order to increase it by however many uh, specific gravity or bricks points you would like to increase it by. Um, but I did write all that in here for you guys so that you would be able to find that and access that because that is important information. And I can tell you that a lot of professional distillers don't know how to do that because they were handed an operation to some degree, even if they earned it, they were handed the existing mash bills, right? Uh, they were handed the existing process. They're not necessarily having to come up with their own mash bills, their own process, all that sort of stuff. And when I do more often than not, the ones that I know of are really doing a, you know, kind of a shot in the dark as far as that goes, because they'll just hit it with exogenous enzymes, which is fine until zombie apocalypse and you really need to make some whiskey. So bear that in mind. It's a survival guide, really. <laughs> All right, guys, shameless self-promotion done and over with out of the way. Hope you enjoyed the video. If you have any questions, reach out to me. Love y'all. I'll catch you later.